is a God of fresh starts and new beginnings and second chances. And if you're ready for some, then you're in the right place. As we're looking at the story of Joshua, the book and the life that tells us how God led the children of Israel into the greatest era in the history of the nation, glory days. And if you're in need of some glory days, you're going to love the story of Joshua. Before we begin, Joshua chapter 9 and 10, the words of our declaration are going to appear on the screen. I want you to push your shoulders back, sit up straight, fill your lungs with air, and say it like you mean it. You ready? These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true, and his word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. Yes, Lord, right now, we receive you in the midst of this moment. We welcome whatever it is that you have to say to us, and we bless you. We ask that you'd please forgive the sins of our speaker. There are so many. And grant that we could see Christ in just Christ. And through his name we pray. And all the church said, Amen. So we send a greeting to the gathering at Fredericksburg, West Side, Outer West, North Central, Journey Fellowship, and all of you watching online, we're so glad that you are here. Many of you look at the bottom of your outline each week to see what the passage is going to be next week so you can come having read the passage. Nope, that's not a misprint you see there. It does say next week, Joshua chapters 11 through 22. 11 chapters in one sermon. You better bring a lunch. <laughs> it's a bit of a tedious read. It describes the dis distribution of the land to the children of Israel. And so I think we can cover it all in just a couple of weeks. And again, it's a bit like reading um, deeds and warrants and going down to the courthouse and reading files. But there's some truths in that that we will mine over the next couple of weeks. And so if you want to come back having read it, we'll look at those chapters. But for today, we're in Joshua chapter 9 and 10. Remember the context. We're following the children of Israel as they inherit the land that God has given to them, looking at these seven years of unparalleled success, why did they receive such favor? And what can we learn so that we too might enter into our promised land? Today's takeaway point is simple. Pray audacious prayers. When Martin Luther's co-worker became ill, the reformer prayed boldly for his healing. He later wrote, I besought the Almighty with great vigor. I attacked him with his own weapons, quoting from Scripture all the promises I could remember that my prayer should be granted and that God must grant my prayer if I was henceforth to put faith in his promises. On another occasion, Martin Luther's good friend Frederick Myconius was sick and Luther wrote his friend saying, I command you in the name of God to live because I still have need of thee in the reforming work of the church. The Lord will never let me hear that thou art dead, but will permit thee to survive me. For this I am praying, this is my will, and may my will be done, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. When John Wesley was crossing the Atlantic Ocean by ship, a great storm came upon the sea. Wesley was in his cabin when he became aware of some confusion on board. When he learned that the storm was knocking the ship off course, he responded in prayer. We know the nature of his prayer because Adam Clark, a great scholar in his own right, was there to record the prayer in his diary. John Wesley prayed, Almighty and everlasting God, you have sway everywhere. 
and all things serve the purpose of your will. You hold the winds in your fist and sit upon the water floods and reign as king forever. Command these winds and these waves that they obey you and take us speedily and safely to the harbor where we would go. Wesley stood up from his knees and he took up his book and he continued to read. Dr. Clark went up on the deck and he found calm winds and the ship was on course. When he reported the answered prayer to John Wesley, Wesley made no remark. So fully did he expect to be heard, wrote Clark, that he took it for granted that he was heard. How bold are your prayers? Boldness in prayer is a new thought for many. We think of speaking softly to God, humbling ourselves before God, having a little talk with Jesus. But agonizing before God, storming heaven with prayers, pounding on the door of the Most High, wrestling with God, isn't such prayer irreverent, presumptuous? Well, it would be had God not invited us to pray as such. So let us come boldly to the very throne of God and stay there to receive his mercy and to find grace to help us in our times of need. Our hero Joshua did this, but not before he didn't. His example teaches us how to pray as well as what happens when we don't pray. If you like to fill in the blanks, let me tell you about a time when Joshua did not pray. In the days immediately after the Shechem gathering that we studied last week, a group of strangers entered Joshua's camp at Gilgal. They told him, your servants have come from a far country. They presented themselves as hapless pilgrims from a distant place, and everything fit their story. Their grain sacks, their sandals, their clothes were worn out. Even their bread was moldy and dry. They claimed to be allies of Joshua. Even more, they praised the accomplishments of God, and they asked Joshua and his men to make a covenant with them. Joshua consulted his advisors, and he weighed the options and eventually agreed. Three days passed before Joshua realized he had been hoodwinked. He had been tricked. These men were not from a distant land. They were from an enemy tribe just 10 to 20 miles away, Gibeon. They wore weathered clothing as a disguise. They brought props of stale bread to fool Joshua. They pretended to be foreigners because they knew what Joshua had done to the people of Jericho and of Ai. They may have also known that God's law made a special provision for cities outside of Canaan. So being afraid, they resorted to deception. And we wonder why didn't Joshua and his men pick this up? The scriptures tell us they did not ask the counsel of the Lord. Scripture slaps Joshua's hands here. He didn't pray. The practice of the Hebrew people was supposed to be pray first, act later. They were supposed to stand before Eleazar, the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord. <laughs> Joshua did everything but this. He and his elders asked careful questions. They investigated the story of the newcomers. They investigated the evidence, but they didn't pray. And they entered into an alliance with the enemy because they did not seek the counsel of God. This alliance quickly proved to be troublesome. The other kings of Canaan saw the Gibeonites, the ones who had disguised themselves as traitors, and these five kings set out to attack the Gibeonites, five armies against one nation. They were outnumbered. But since they had an alliance with Joshua, 
They turned to the Hebrews to help, and because he had given his word, Joshua had no choice but to come to their rescue. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, that's their encampment, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them. For I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. These five kings, they never stood a chance. They retreated before they had a chance to advance. Apparently, they did not expect Joshua to respond with such fervor. They turned and they ran with the Hebrew army hot on their heels. And as Joshua thundered behind them, the clouds began to thunder over them. If you read the text, you noticed in verse 11 that large hailstones began to fall from the sky like carpet bombs. It was midday. Joshua saw the hailstones falling and he anticipated the sun setting and he realized, I need more time. This day is passing too quickly. He had the upper hand, yet nightfall would give the enemy time to regroup if he just had a few more hours of daylight. He could win the battle. He could strike a decisive blow at the defense of the Canaanites. And so he began to pray. He had failed to pray about the Gibeonites, but he didn't make the same mistake twice. Let me tell you about when Joshua did pray. Reading from the message translation, the day God gave the Amorites up to Israel, Joshua spoke to God with all Israel listening. Stop, sun, over Gibeon. Halt, moon, over Ajalon Valley. And sun stopped. Moon stood stock still until he defeated his enemies. You can find this written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in its tracks in mid-sky, just sat there all day. There's never been a day like that before or since. God took orders from a human voice. Truly, God fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Joshua's victory that day was complete. The Hebrews defeated the five enemy kings in one fell swoop. And the conquering of the promised land was all but guaranteed. What made the difference? The audacious prayer of Joshua. Joshua called out to God. He asked the maker of the heavens to press the cosmic pause button. I think it's interesting that the narrator, knowing that his readers would be shocked at the story, referred to the book of Jasher, an extra biblical volume that just contains stories, a history of the Hebrew people. He was stating, in essence, if you find this hard to believe, check out the history book. The verse I think that deserves your highlighter is verse 14. God took orders from a human voice. God in his providence chose to hear and heed Joshua's request. Does he still? Would he still? Might he still? This is the question. Does God listen when we pray? Like Joshua, you face battles. Five kings are bearing down upon you right now. Discouragement, deception, defeat, destruction, and death. They roar into your world like a hell's angel motorcycle gang. And their goal is to chase you back into the wilderness. And you have two choices. You can either turn away and run or you can turn to God and pray. Respond in prayer. Respond in bold, honest, continual, and audacious prayer. God's there listening for all who pray, for all who pray and mean it. 
The Lord is not far from each of us. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. God will give good things to those who ask him. Walk away with a couple of lessons from Joshua's prayer life. Number one, consult God in everything. Consult God in everything. You see, you need God's guidance. The Gibeonites disguised themselves as impoverished pilgrims. Your enemy disguises himself as well. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Your enemy comes disguised as a harmless dinner with a married man or a fun night with the guys at the men's club or an opportunity to make a profit by shaving the expense account. He's crafty, but you're not alone in your defense. Seek God always, immediately, quickly. Live with one ear toward heaven. Here's your promise. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall what? Direct your paths. You know what? You cannot talk to God about too much. Other people will get tired of listening to you, but God never will. Other people will say that's too much detail, too much information. God says, bring it on. I want to hear it. If it matters to you, it matters to God. Because you see, our relationship with God is exactly that. It's a relationship. And his invitation is clear and simple. He says, come and talk with me, oh my people. And our response, Lord, I'm coming. It's that simple. We abide with him and he abides with us. And as we journey through life, he begins to tell us, turn here, turn there, step here, step there. He doesn't give us everything we need all at once. He gives it to us as we need it. I tried this level of guidance with my wife, Dinalyn, once. We were using the GPS on my smartphone to locate a particular destination. Deanlin was driving and I was riding in the passenger seat, holding the phone, watching on the phone the map. And just for the fun of it, I muted the volume on the voice. And I told Deanlin that I would share the direction at the moment she needed it. Don't worry, she, I told her, right when you need to know. I will tell you, but not a second sooner. She did not like that plan. <laughs> she wanted to know the entire itinerary at once. She preferred to have all the information rather than bits and pieces. But I told her, honey, this is good spiritual training. <laughs> God works this way. And she was quick to say, but you're not God. So I gave her the entire itinerary. But God doesn't. God doesn't. He will give you what you need for today's questions today. His word is a light unto your feet, not a spotlight into the future. He will give you what you need today for today. He will help you against the devil. He will disclose the craftiness of Satan, but we must consult him in everything. Glory days are such because we learn to hear God's voice telling us, turn this way or turn that. Scripture says your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go. Whether to the right or to the left. Do you want some glory days? Then you refer every decision to the tribunal of heaven. You do your best to wear heaven out with your requests and questions. You never turn your ear away from God. In response, he will bend low, the psalmist said, and hear my whispered plea. Wait until God speaks before you act. Be patient. Check your impulse. If you feel a check on your heart, heed it. Stop. Ask God again. 
Don't move until you sense the green light from God. This is the only way to outmatch the devil's deceit. Consult God in everything and call on God for great things. Call on God for great things. Imitate Joshua. Ask God to defeat the enemies of the promised land. If that means the interruption of earthly rotation, so be it. You see, when it comes to advancing the kingdom, no request is unrealistic. Remember who you are. This is the big message of Joshua. You are inheriting, not earning, the promised land. This is your land. You were made to be here. You are God's child. You're an heir to God's fortune. You have obtained an inheritance. The will has been executed. The courts have been satisfied. Your spiritual account has been funded. Paul the apostle says, this resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. You can pray bold prayers because you are God's child. You can pray bold prayers because you're not just a run-of-the-mill person on this planet. You have been bought by the blood of Christ and you have been placed into his family. So you come to God not as a stranger, but as an heir to the promise. You approach God's throne not as an interloper, but as a child in whom the Spirit of God dwells. You don't swagger into God's presence, but neither do you sneak and creep into God's presence. You're not cocky, but neither are you mousy. You step into the throne room of God having been invited by him. And when you step into the throne room of God, all the angels step back and they say, oh, we recognize you. You're one of his children and you are welcome here having been invited by him, escorted by his son, accompanied by his spirit, you can earnestly make your request known to him, knowing he will do what is right. Not because of what you have achieved, but because of what Christ has done. Jesus spilled his blood for you. Consequently, you can spill your heart before God. Now, maybe you don't need the sun to stop, but boy, you need the temptation to leave. You need the fog of fear to lift. You need the cancer to vanish. You don't need a longer day, but you likely need a deeper faith, a stronger resolve or a higher call. Your first response when temptation or trouble comes, pray audacious prayers. Pray against the pornography that plagues your husband. Pray against the guilt that burdens your wife. Pray against the violence in our city, the evil in our neighborhoods, and the corruption in our streets. God hears the prayers of his people, and he is partial to his children. He hears the prayers of all people, but he especially hears the prayers of those who have trusted his son to save them. This is your privilege and your responsibility. And he will hear when you pray. During the season I was working on this sermon, I had the opportunity to lead a group of 500 people to Israel. One morning we had a Bible study on the th southern steps of the Temple Mount. This precious ascent remains much the way it appeared 2,000 years ago when Jesus and his disciples gathered there. Our group sat with the eastern sun on their left shoulder and the temple wall to their backs. And behind them, there was the dome of the rock, 
the third holiest site in the Muslim faith. For my lesson, I chose a phrase out of John 3, 16, one and only. Since we were standing where Jesus himself stood, it seemed only right to consider the claim that Jesus himself made, that he was the one and only Son of God. And the fact that we sat in the shadow of a mosque dedicated to Muhammad only accentuated the contrast. A few minutes into the message, a mysterious voice began to mock my words. It was high-pitched. It was eerie. Each time I said, one and only, it parroted, one and only. Each time I said the name Jesus, a voice from somewhere, heavy with accent, would mimic, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The interruption had all the earmarks of a spiritual conflict, Christ being again proclaimed in a holy place in the holy city where he stood, Christ being mocked where he was mocked then. Jesus' authority declared, Jesus' authority belittled. I could tell that the voice came from back behind the people, but I just couldn't see where. I searched the walls but saw nothing. People began to turn and look for the origin of the voice, as did the guides and the guards, but no one could isolate it. The more I preached, the more it parroted. For fear of conceding defeat to this odd force, I decided not to stop. The second point in my message was Christ, the one and only ruler. And rather than preach the point, I decided to pray the point. Jesus is the supreme authority of this place, any place and every place, I pray. Which, by the way, includes you demons, you servants of hell, and you Satan himself, if you're the one issuing this voice. You are not welcome in this gathering. And I repeated the declaration several times in the group began to shout amen and applaud and stand. And within moments, the voice was suddenly silent. It stopped completely as if a switch had been flipped. We finished the Bible lesson in peace. Afterwards, I asked the tour leader, I said, you must have found the culprit. He said, we never did. We tried, but we could not find him. Now, a person might chalk the sudden silence of the scoffer up to coincidence. I choose not to. I chalk it up to providence. That when the authority of Christ is proclaimed, that when a child of God declares the presence of God, that Satan has to turn and leave. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. This is the authority that you have been given as a child, as a son or daughter of God. And this includes any voice, any force that is seeking right now to drive you out of the promised land. Remember, God fights for you. So you will not have to fight this battle. Take your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Church, Call on God. Call on God. Declare the name of Jesus. Ask. It will be given to you. If you believe, you will get anything you ask for in prayer. You are not without hope because you are not without prayer. You are never on your own. You may think you are. You may feel like you are, but I want to tell you, you are one prayer away from a new day. You just keep praying. You just keep talking. You consult God in everything. You keep an ear toward heaven, and you call on God for great things. And you might bring a little extra sunscreen. 
because this day of victory that awaits you is going to last a long, long time. Do you receive it? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that you give us that our prayers are heard and heeded by the God of heaven. And today we stand upon this promise, Father. We stand upon this, that we are not impotent. We are not without power. We are not without resources. We are not without strength because we have prayer. Forgive our prayerlessness. Grant us hearts of vigor and prayer. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. And all the church said, Amen. Amen.